From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, it's simple. Observations. Practice observations. Whole bunch of them. Let's go. Wake up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. CPTallyBar.com, the website, 2475 Appalachia Parkway here in the capital city, Florida. You know that. Lunch specials Monday through Friday, only $8.99 from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Enjoy. Today, a chicken strip basket, hand-breaded chicken strips, served with a dipping sauce or tossed in a sauce if you're choosing, and a side dish of your choosing. Only $8.99 from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. It's Friday. Cut out of work a little bit early on your lunch break. Tell Maslon said so. I think that is somewhat valid in some corners of, of some offices. Maybe not the most successful endeavors out there, but trying for you folks. Head out to the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill and hang out this weekend. Final Four. Watch it on the Vegas screens and some live music as well this weekend, I would assume. Yes, Corey? Don't know. Don't think so. Okay. Again, though, Saturday night, like I said, at oh, yeah. the Seventh Hills, yes. they got the uh, the fight night. Mm. Uh, all you UFC fans, uh, so get there early. So cover like fifteen dollars maybe, uh, but you get to watch all the fights and you get it's a cool place. Seventh Hills, right below Corner Pocket, with a cool menu, a different menu from Corner Pocket, but uh, it's a little more low key. Uh, but it's a lot of UFC fans, so if you want to go there and watch the fights, uh, they're they're open for business. All right, Warchant.com, the ultimate seminal sports source. Won't you hit the thumbs up, five-star rating and review. Subscribe as well. Uh, that'd be super cool. I'm trying to find it right now. Where did it go, Aslan? You had it, and here it is. We got a, we got a little, bit, a little bit of a promo for the folks on YouTube, but also you get folks on uh, the podcast too. Use the promo code FSU1, and you get two months of access to Warchant.com for only $1. Mm. So... FSU one, two months, one dollar. Come on home. We've been waiting for you this whole time. Corey, how are you, man? I'm good, buddy. How are you? I'm well. Missed you the other day. Um, I had. I've got a present for you. I, well, not so much me, but our, our friends over at Cummins. Oh. Good news. Good news. Bad news. Okay. Uh, good news is all of it's awesome. Uh, bad news is three out of the four articles of clothing are white. Ooh, okay, that's fine, but it's swag. I got a little coming swag. Yeah. And are they are they small shirts or medium shirts? Medium, medium. Nice. I like it. I like it because they can shrink a little bit in the dryer, mm. and then I can really show off the muscles. Very soft. One nice polo, one uh, black and whitish grayish. So that'll be a, an everyday wear for you. Hopefully, yeah. just gotta wear this when you're on camera at home. And we're talking about our friends over at Cummins. Follow their Instagram, Cummins Lifestyle, everybody. Uh, and then like a Travis Matthew, who I think is some fancy golf designer. It's like a yeah. ninety dollar polo, man. It's yeah, all, yeah, it's those are nice. Those are uh, I bought one of those shirts once. Uh, yeah, they aren't they aren't cheap. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's nice. Okay, man. All right, I like what's going on here. Do you not trust yourself wearing white clothing? Like, are you afraid you're going to spill something on it? I no, refuse this. My, like, I don't look good in white thing because everyone looks good in white. Everyone looks good in white. Everyone looks good in black. Is this how it works? Not, not when you're uh, as pale as I am. Nah. It's my complexion. I'm already pasty, and it's like throwing glue on top of paste. It doesn't look great. But, I'll hey, I'll rock it, or I'll get a spray tan again. I don't right. care. I got, I, I got no – I'm not ashamed of getting a spray tan. I'm I might bleed onto the shirt, tans. though, then that's a problem. That's a good point. It's a fair point, but it's worth it. It's yeah. worth it to be able to rock a white shirt. All right, Corey, uh, do you know what this sound is? Uh, get ready to do your taxes. <laughs> This is brought to you by H and R Block. Um, <laughs> no, this is a this is a sheet of observations. Mm. I really wish you were there on Thursday, man, because I thought it was not a great day, and I would oh. have really liked to use your perspective and your um, your nuance to maybe push back on some things. Uh, I'm a reactionary guy. It was not a good day. I think most everybody that watched practice would agree to that. Defense won. Protection did not hold up particularly well in eleven on eleven. Uh, some drops again, not maybe nearly as many, but drops and still balls hitting the ground in terms of inaccurate passes. Um, just again, it just, man, last year's team was really, really good. 
and we saw like a level of consistency and excellence out of them every single day. Um, this team has not put together anything close to that yet. Early, I get it. It's early, everybody. Aslan's not panicking, but it just sounds know. like Aslan is panicking. Still, I'm playoffs, just hey, from playoffs somebody still. that wasn't okay. All right, okay. I, I just but don't not know. Undefeated. I don't know if you're a national championship. I just think like I, I just think of Georgia and what Georgia seemingly lost from that team that played in Miami. Right. Not a whole lot, and what you've added, um, you know. I mean, probably two lose. score game, still like a two score game. I feel like right now. Okay, that's where uh, I'm at. I mean, Against who did. I think is probably the odds-on favorite to win the national title. Yeah, I mean they, but they lost, uh, you know, McConkey and Bowers and Mims and a bunch of good defensive guys too. I mean they lost, but it's Georgia. They're reloading. Uh, but yeah, again, I, I get what you're saying. I understand. Um, I just think, you know, when we and I, I'm certainly not here to tell you that this offense is going to be uh, incredible. And that DJ is going to be better than Jordan because I I think I've been pretty clear about that. Uh, he isn't. We know that. Like, there's one thing we know going into this season is that DJ is not as good as Jordan Travis. And that's not a shot at DJ. Well, no quarterback on this roster is as good as Jordan Travis. Right. But, um, you know, th there's so many move, not even moving parts, just working parts that have to get acclimated to th in new roles, are roles they've never been in before. But that doesn't mean they're not going to be really good. Um, it's just, you know, they're number one, they're going up against a good defense. Um, I thought Shaheen Brown said something interesting, but probably true. And we've heard it before, though. But he said, we know we're the best secondary those guys are going to face all season. This is could uh, be true. Could and be I true. think it probably is true, right? Yeah. Um, and, and it's, that's you know, we heard that, you know, James Blackman used to say, I think we're the best team in the country. We're still going to win national championship. Be like, all right, man, what? But Shaheen Brown saying that, isn't just player speak. It's like legitimately, I think he thinks that. And there is a very good chance that's probably true. As this secondary is currently constructed, there's nobody on the roster, there's nobody on the schedule um, that is as good, I think, as what these guys are going up against every day. So that's good, man. That really is good. And it would be weird if they were dominating. But I also understand, you know, as you're halfway through the spring now, and it's still, is, it's choppy. It's inconsistent on offense, um, and it, there's truth to that. There is, but I also think that's – for me, it's kind of hard to judge because I think all football practices look like this. I'm not last year's team, man. But there, they, I don't think last year's team in the spring especially you were going, uh, all right, another home run, another 70-yard uh, another play. There's another 50-yard play. There's another great play. I mean, Jordan Travis didn't throw a lot of picks, obviously. He didn't throw a lot of incompletions. The ball never hit the ground, man. But there weren't uh, – uh, it, but it wasn't It wasn't just up and down the field. Just the Offense didn't just dominate every every day of the spring. But, again, Jordan isn't DJ. Uh, I, I, but I, I get what you're saying. You know, I read – Ira. I wrote the story after practice, and Ira sent me his observations. So I got a feel for it uh, of how practice went. And, uh, yeah, it sounds like the defense won again. Yes. Um, I think – uh, if this defense can be similar to what it was last year, this football team will be in the playoff. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm still, you know? still playoff. I just again, um, you know. The, well, hey, the hey, level. baby steps, man. You got to yeah. get to the playoff first. Obviously, last year's team wasn't even good enough to get to the playoff. <laughs> so, if this year's team can trump last year's team, you you feel good about things. All right, we'll give Corey. Uh, three timeouts where he can stop me throughout uh, these observations I'm about to give you. Double sided. Oh out. my gosh! Let's not. Let's. Can you? How about this? Before, I, instead of just a Whoa, rundown, so play by about? play. What do you mean so rude? I let you talk all the time. Let me talk on one show. No, but I, I want you to talk. But I want you to talk not just about like, hey, DJ hit Jakai for eleven yards. DJ did this. Like, was there anybody that stood out? Like before you even do a play by play of uh, like one on ones or seven on seven, was there a player or two or play that stood out that you think you should talk about that you should highlight? Because I think I got one, and I wasn't even there. Justin Cryer? There it is. Is my man going to start? I think so. Right? Him and so DJ tell, tell the people, did you see the play? Tell the people what happened. So that we're, we're totally skipping through all my observations from period no, no, 9. No, no, we're not. No, Oh, I thought this was early on in practice. I thought was, this was the first part of this practice. This was period 11. So period 9 okay. was the, the, the three receivers in like a trips formation, and then you guys want to know whether or not they could block in the slot. And out wide, we'll talk about that later, but we'll go to period 11. This was an 11 on 11 period outside, Corey, where uh, they were on the plus side of the field, like at the 10-yard line, 
Um, it seemed like around, maybe not the 10-yard line, but they were on the plus side of the field, 20-yard line, red zone-ish. Yeah. Uh, do we want to know the quarterback who was out there yeah. leading the offense? All right. So, I, I, wrote, I wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was the, the – I don't know if there's a first team or a second team, but when they start these seven-on-seven seven drills and they go to the next period and then it's one-on-ones and then they go to the next period and then it's 11-on-11, 11 11, Brock Glenn's not starting every single time when they start that period. DJ Uwe Ungale is not the first guy out there with an offense every time they go to a new period. They're mixing and matching guys. So in this period, it was DJ was first up on – on this 11 on 11 period and Grady Kelly, I don't know who he disrupted and dislodged off the line of scrimmage, but he, he knocked somebody back and applied a lot of pressure on the play. And it was a throw, like a touch pass. The DJ tried to get off and it was tipped uh, one handed interception caught by Justin Cryer. And it would have been, it would have been housed. In, in That's a, real a touchdown, game. right? That's like yes. a 90 yard touchdown. Yes. Probably. Yes. That's what, it, so that he, man, I know they lost by 60 points. Um, he was, he was, I thought he was impressive ish as much as, as most as you can be when you don't force a punt in an entire game or whatever it was. I thought he, uh, he, you know, equipped himself, equate himself pretty well, um, against Georgia for a guy that hadn't played a lot and was a true freshman. And I thought, I, I thought I noticed him at times last year, just in practices I'm talking about, like he just flashed a little bit and then he's making plays like that. Um, as a redshirt freshman, he might be a true sophomore. I don't know how what his eligibility is, but it's his second year in college football. That kind of excites you, right? Like he might be a real player. Mm-hmm. That's that's uh, and it's not just one play, but that sounds like a, a highlight real play. Yeah, it was it was fantastic, and he's been he's been all around the football. He's been a very sure tackler. It's been good to see. So yeah, I, I guess right now, what him and DJ, we would assume, I guess that's yeah. probably your two. Uh... If they're doing the four two five, which they they would, maybe Georgia Tech, it's a four three. Because Tech runs uh, more, you know they're they're going to try to run the ball. But yeah, I think I think it'll be a four-two-five. And right now, um, but again, we're in April, early April. But I I would think it's DJ and Cryer um, mm. have been the two that have impressed me the most so far. Demarco Ward had a pretty good day, and I think again, you mentioned him on the show. And he show. had a good one on yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. yeah so. Okay, Demarco. He's from Joy. He's from Gwinnett County. He Stand is. up, man. He is. All right. He is. Uh, we'll finish out that period each. Guy had one sort of drive, if you will. Again, I'm pretty sure it was the 10-yard line, and you know, uh, either sink or swim. Uh, next up was Brock Glenn handoff, Kaziah Holmes to the house. Get you some. Yeah. And it, 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 Ira made it sound like the two oppo- the uh, the defense really celebrated Cryer's play. Yes. And then the offense came back and celebrated pretty big when Kaziah scored. Right. Yeah. Period nine. There was there was literally three scrums. Yeah. So that little feisty, little yes, feisty out there. Set the yeah. foundation. Beautiful yeah. day in Tallahassee. Not sure why everybody was grumpy, right? Uh, but guys were ornery in period nine, and then we go to period eleven, which was that eleven on eleven um, period that we're talking about here. So DJ throws the interception that that Cryer snags with one hand and would have housed it. Uh, Brock Glenn makes a handoff. Kaziah Holmes in the offensive line take care of business, and then Luke Cromanhawk uh, is pushed the third down and throws an absolute. Uh, Accurate strike right in the front pylon of the end zone uh, to none other than Luane McCoy. My dog, the freshman. real McCoy. The yeah. real McCoy. Yeah, there you go. Some, some would say that. Yeah, so uh, that period is probably like the, the high point for the offense because uh, they, they struck a touchdown which each single unit, if you will, out there. So, um, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. That, that was a pick six, the first one. Two so, out of three. It's still three. a touchdown. Yeah, that's too Pick six, still a touchdown. Touche. All right, we'll go inside now. Uh, period 15, one-on-ones, Corey. My guy, Quindarius Jones, gave the business to Hakeem Williams three different times. Okay. And he let All him right. know about it the third time. Like, he was yeah. he was running back uh, to the line of scrimmage or back to, like, the huddle, if you will. And I forgot the defensive back, but literally, like, yelled at Quindarius, like, no, 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 stop. Go back and remind him of what you just did. And they both jogged over to Hakeem and – uh, kind of fan their their hand in front of their nose, like ooh, stinky. Like we just we just get we put the gas mask on you. And Hakeem mm. took it like a champ. You know, he's like, all right, you got me on this day. So uh, he was the star of period fifteen. My guy Quindarius Jones, Jalen Brown uh, had two huge routes like deep downfield where he beat coverage. Yeah, one of them unfortunately he dropped. Uh, the other one he did catch. It was over a walk-on, uh, but he, he caught it. So we'll give him credit for that because that's a real thing. And that was off the arm of Brock Glenn, the one that he caught. 
Uh, the one that he dropped was off the arm of DJ Uwe Ungalale. Uh, two other highlights from that period of one-on-one, Corey. A stick with the Brock Glenn. Uh, very nice throw. Uh, kind of like, you know, I don't know, back hip, front hip. I mean, he Azarie was no longer in phase. He was he just fell out of phase with Kentron Portier, and the, and the throw was perfectly on stride. It was like a line. It wasn't a, a very arcing throw. It was it was kind of a rope, and Kentron caught it on the fly and, and would have been gone in a, in a real live game situation on Azarie. Um, the second one was an absolute bomb from Luke Cromenhawk to Camden Fryer, Corey, uh, like yeah. a deep post and 14, who I think is Kai Bates. Kai was, Bates, yeah. He was in phase, had like a hand, like almost inside the Jersey that, that, that came loose. And it, it like scraped Fryer's face mask as it was getting dislodged and Fryer still maintained his focus and caught the deep pass. That was good. Uh, easily, arguably the, the best catch of the one-on-one period. Um, Judging it's that, it probably block. his best play of spring so far. Camp yeah. Fryer, I'm talking oh, yeah. about. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would say that period, that one-on-one um, period right there, that Brock got the best of it when it came to the quarterbacks. Uh, staying inside for the rest of the day, period 17, we go to seven on seven. Uh, Brock, couple short completions. Uh, meanwhile, DJ, I thought had the, the better throw out of the three quarterbacks in that period where. Uh, he had a lot of time on this one, but Jalen Brown ended up finding like a really soft spot in the zone, probably 15, 20 yards downfield. And DJ just absolutely flicked one in there on a, on a freaking straight line. Uh, that was really nice. Do span also uh, beat coverage uh, on that uh, period. So mm. tip of the cap to deuce. Uh, so I gave DJ the leg up in the seven on seven period. And that then uh, I think uh, at least for my notes, that were texted to me from the great Irish Chaffel that uh, Jalen Brown also had a touchdown uh, during the 7-on-7 seven seven when they did red zone 7-on-7. Seven seven. Um, I don't know who was against, or I don't even know who threw it. Maybe Brock Glenn threw it, but it was a touchdown. And the reason I bring that up is because we've said so far in the first 15 minutes of this show, I think we've said the name Jalen Brown more than we have the first the last two weeks. Well, that's also because we forgot to mention that Destin Hill is out for the rest of the spring. Well, that's where I was going. Oh, I sorry, didn't forget sorry. to mention it. You cut you cut off what was going to be the best transition <laughs> sorry. in uh, Wake Up War Chant I'll history. I'll fix it in post-production. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, yeah. so after practice, Norvell, uh, you know, let it be known that Destin Hill uh, and Jarrell Powers, the backup tight end, are out for the rest of the spring with undisclosed injuries. Um, but, you know, that that's a it's a big loss for the spring clearly because I thought Destin Hill was playing really well but you know you're Florida State now in 2024 well you get to go to a uh, four and a half star that might be really really good as a guy that can now he lifts you know now it's next man up but it's instead of next man up being some two star from nowhere you've got a kid that was at LSU last year that was almost a five star coming out of high school that can really run it really it can be a, a real matchup nightmare and it's good to see, even though he dropped the one, it's good to see Jalen Brown looking like the guy we were kind of projecting him to, right? Mm. Like, he looks like he could be something. Yes. Um, and that's yes. good, really good to see because there's a chance he might be needed to be something this year. So I think, again, on that one, uh, DJ had the, the leg up in 17. We go to period 18, cash down, seven on seven. Brock won that segment I would say with his completion to Kentron who was in coverage uh, Shaheem was all over him and I don't know how that ball fit in there but it did Kentron caught it uh, meanwhile there was a PBU on DJ's rep he had a whole bunch of time and you know, he threw a pass to Jalen Brown but that would have been whistled dead in any kind of real situation he had a quick out to uh, our guy Jackson West so I gave Brock the edge in period 18 period 19 7 on 7 red zone Corey 20 yard line uh, this was DJ's um, sort of uh, – actually, I'm sorry. It was Brock's period again. So another one for Brock. Mark it down for Brock. Uh, touchdown to guess who? Jalen Brown. Jalen Downtown Brown. Yeah. Uh, it was after a short completion to Van Dravia. So on this period where they're seven on seven red zone 20-yard line, they, they spot the ball after the last play. Some of these situations, they'll just keep running from the same – down in distance, if you will, no matter what. But on this one, it was kind of like a an actual, you know, sequence of plays that you would run or whatever. So Brock goes incomplete, completes a second on the second down pass. 
uh, to Vandravis Jacobs, and on third down, uh, just a really nice play design, and, and Jalen worked himself pretty wide open, and Brock was able to deliver it in there uh, for the touchdown on there. Uh, also, nice play hookup with Luke Cromanhawk and Luane McCoy in that period. Uh, okay. DJ was betrayed with a drop by Malik Benson. Uh, next pass was to Malik Benson as well as incomplete, and then the following play, the third down, just there was nothing going on, so he he ran, and they whistled it dead, and not a whole lot of positivity came from that one. Back to 11-on-11 11 11 now. We're almost done. Three periods, everybody. Uh, TFL by our guy Tommy Wadurajaye. Hmm. He's got an asterisk next to that one, so I, I had to make sure I talked about that one. Really good run when Luke Cromanhawk was out there on a handoff pitch. Not sure exactly how it went to Jalen Lucas. Uh, also a first down completion to Caden, or I'm sorry, Camden Fryer. Apologize, Camden. Two plays out of him that day. Also a very nice rush by Lawrence Toafili when – DJ was out there leading the offense. Uh, he did have a, uh, a throw downfield to Kentron that was, I don't even know if you could call it over the shoulder, Corey. Like it, it seemed to have gone directly like over Kentron's head, and he was trying to hold his hand out there like for a basket catch and maybe a little bit body better body control, maybe a little bit cleaner route, and, and that could be a deep touchdown catch. But the way it was thrown, the way it was ran, it, it went deep and off of his hands. Uh, so that was kind of a bit of a bummer. TFL uh, in there by DeMarco Murray in that period as well. And this is like the one play that kind of signified. DeMarco Ward. DeMarco Ward, sorry. Who did I say, DeMarco Murray? Yeah, he'd be a, hey, he'd be yeah. a welcome addition. Yeah, we can use some run, more running backs or whatever. Like the, this one play, and I'm just going to I'm gonna say everybody's name in it, but it was Brock Glenn scrambling in 11-on-11. Like not scrambling, but but rolling out. And Vandravis Jacobs had his guy beat. It was a deep throw, probably 30, 40 yards downfield. And if the, if the ball is thrown with the proper amount of trajectory, if you will, I think Van Dravis Jacobs catches it and it's a touchdown. But he it was underthrown regardless, though. Van Dravis should have caught the ball, even though it was underthrown. But he had to stop and readjust himself. Right. And it hit him right in the hands, and he dropped it. And he, he got very upset with himself, and he threw the ball afterwards. And three quality control guys yelled at him. Uh, Norvell yelled at him. And like to me, that was the the microcosm of the day. It's like wildly talented guys making plays, almost. You right. know, it was like Brock almost makes the perfect throw, Van Dravis almost bails his quarterback out on the not perfect throw, but none of it kind of came together and melted correctly. So that was kind of like the microcosm of the day to me. Um, finishing it out, two last periods. Uh, period twenty two. DJ wins this period. The last one I thought was Luke had the best one with the throws to. Camden and the handoff to Jalen Lucas. This is where, again, Jalen Brown absolutely just darts down the field, uh, beats the coverage. I put two asterisks next to this one, Corey. It was so nice. Oh, okay. So uh, DJ wins that period. Nothing really happened with Brock on that one. And then period 23 was the, the final one that we actually got to kind of watch. It was very similar to Tuesday, Corey, where they were sort of in that late minute, last second situation, plus side of the field, try to get some yardage before you kick a game-winning go-ahead, tying field goal. Um, Aaron Hester with a real nice okay. play. He's right. a guy that – he's 6'2", 230, so he's 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 too big to be a linebacker, and he's not big enough to be an, an effective every-down kind of defensive end. But there's something there. He's a young kid. He's one guy that literally last year seemingly was injured the entire – freaking season so he's like he's not even a, a year two freshman a redshirt freshman he's still kind of like a freshman freshman because he really isn't able to get a lot of live action reps so very curious to see how he because he looks like he can do something in maybe another year or so um so that's what i got for you folks and uh yeah Fitzgerald hit the field goal uh, in the first part of that period there so and i would add a couple more uh you know just going from ira's notes patrick payton had a couple of sacks he did um, yes in 11 yes. on 11 marvin jones had a couple of tfls um just to remind L uh, lola Hea did too like combined maybe with hussey for a tfl somebody did but uh just kind of reminded everyone it's uh that defensive line can be pretty stout and uh they, when, when the offense isn't doing well which is a lot of the time in 11 on 11 the defense has something to do with it, and they are going up against a good defense. Uh, if they were if they were struggling against the 2020 Florida State defense, we'd you, you'd be really worried right now. But this is a good one. This is going to be perhaps one of the better defenses in the United States. We all know last year's was. Uh, maybe this one will be similar. Uh, so that's good. And you know, Aslan, we we talk about it, but I just 
I just want to reemphasize that uh, what the deep ball in how much more prevalent it is mm. in these practices that we watch, not just compared to games last year. I'm talking about compared to just the practices last year. Well, Tate would lip, let it rip occasionally. But uh, more often than not, man, it was all intermediate to short kind of throws or kind of jump balls to the two bad ass out wide. Like it wasn't just – I mean, they take – what would – even in one on ones, they didn't do it a lot. Um, and now I would I would guesstimate they take deep deep shots or practice them twenty five times. Well, remember that time you talked about Adam Fuller doing the op, the mission takeaway, and it was like seven shot was the name yeah. of the period. I think it sounds crazy because it can't be now that I'm thinking about it because it's a one on one situation. But when they go inside those one on ones that they run, where they're they're pretty much like on their the negative side, the field, like on the five yard line, man, they let it rip. Yeah, to where I've never I don't remember. And that's not what they used to do. No, not at least not last year. That wasn't something they did a lot. When I watched every rep of every one on one all season last year, it wasn't a lot of deep shots. And if they were deep shots, they were kind of um, I don't know, man, like fades to the sideline. They weren't just straight up, roll the right, plant your back foot, and let it effing rip. Hmm. And they do that a lot, which makes sense because they are faster. And they don't have the two guys, at least right now, that can just – you could just lob it 22 yards downfield, down the sideline, and they'll go get you a first down. And if they break a tackle, it might be a 60-yard gain. They don't have that, but they have dudes that can run by you. What I do want to see is more contested catches. That's just something you're going to have to see. It's not, you know, look, I think they're fast. I think there's a fast wide receiver core, but, you know, DBs are fast these days too. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to just be able to sprint past everybody you play. So some of these plays, you you can't, they're not all, these throw, the, the farther you are away from the line of scrimmage, the harder it is to make a perfect throw. Like it's hard to make a throw that's right into the bread basket 55 yards away. It's easy to do it on a swing pass. It's hard to do it 55 yards away. So will these receivers, like you mentioned, Van Dravius, will they be able to help out their quarterbacks when it's not an absolute perfect throw? Uh, that's what I want to see, but I love seeing the deep shots. I just love it. It, it makes sense. Mm. Also, these guys get paid a lot of money, and they're smart dudes, and they know what they're doing. Like, yeah, man, you don't, you don't bring in DJ to throw a bunch of uh, intermediate passes. He's got a home run arm. You're going to use it. You're going to use it. So uh, just like you wouldn't bring in a great power hitter and bat him ninth and tell him to sack bun a lot. Hmm. He's here. He's going to throw. He'll throw more deep balls in the first month than Jordan Travis might have in the last two seasons combined. That's just what this offense will be more of. So it's going to be like, you know, you know, I know I, I think as our Ira said that the best play of the day was a portier catch. I don't remember who it was. Against. Oh, it was against AZ at some point. Yeah, that's the one but I it, mentioned. Yeah, yeah, it was a deep ball. AZ like dove and tried to yeah. PBU and couldn't. So, but the point being like there, you know, and I think Van Dravius had a long one that he did catch in one-on-ones. But, um, you, you know, they, they, they're going to, but they're going to be some mistakes. They're going to be some missteps. They're going to, it's not going to be a lot of consistent greatness. But man, you hit two big bombs a game. Yeah, yeah, you're going to win a lot. So, uh, you know, and obviously that probably won't happen, but the threat and the ability of this guy's arm, uh, well, really all three, man, they all rip it now. Brock Glenn has an arm and Luke really has an arm. Mm. Like they're they're all impressive to watch, but, you know, DJ is a different level. But, yeah, it's it's just it's fun to see that, okay, you know, and we should have, we know this. It's Mike Norvell. He's a really good head football coach, but you kind of adapt your offense to what you got. Last year, you had a great, um, I don't know what you'd call it, the, the mental acuity of your quarterback was great. He didn't, the have the, he didn't have the strongest arm in the world, but could read a defense and take what it gave him uh, better than anybody probably Norvell's ever had. And they did it to the tune of 13 wins. Well, 11 with him, and then, well, really 10 with him, and then three with other quarterbacks. But, uh, you know, that was, that was Jordan Travis's offense, was uh, kind of dink and dunk. Hit some plays in the middle of the field where maybe you break a tackle, but it wasn't a big play, 70-yard, throw it deep, throw it over the safety all the time. This will be more, I think, of what uh, – I mean, it'll just be like Tamori and Terry back in the day. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Blackman to Terry, that great combo. So I, I just that's what's exciting about um, the the potential of this offense. But it does lend itself to some ugliness too. I think once we get after, out of the spring game, might start watching some old Clemson games and see if DJ is surrounded by a staff that's more in line with the way Clemson looked in like 21 and 22 or like that one game that he had in 20, like the COVID. I feel like he had two in 20. Like I think he started the next week and threw for a bunch of yards oh. too. Uh, but he had better players, obviously, right? Well, that's the thing. I, don't, I mean, I know that team – competed for the national title. They made it to the playoff that year, but I don't know if Trevor Lawrence had, you know, it's still, I don't think it was, I think it was, I still think it was Justin Ross um, was probably part of it. So yeah, just going to check it out. Maybe T Higgins still there, mm, maybe, but yeah. um, cause I just wonder, you know, he, he you know, he's had this arm his whole life and it, it hasn't probably come together perfectly for him in the way he foresaw his career unfolding so but yeah hey, that no. The, no, the Notre Dame game that we all remember uh was his second start uh, his first start was against Boston College the week before where they barely won they won 34 to 28 but he was 30 of 41 for 342 and then the next week at Notre Dame that they lost Notre Dame was fourth in the country they lost in double overtime he was 29 of 44 for 439 with four touchdowns combined in those two games and, and no interceptions so he has played well when he had good talent around him. And obviously 2021 and 2022, those Clemson teams, I don't, what did they, I'm going to look up that box score. You keep talking. I'm sorry. I'm going to look up that box score and see who he was throwing to. All right. Well, how about I talk about our good friends over at uh, Vitamin Energy? VitaminEnergy.com. I should have taken a mood plus before recording this show, but I'm in a good mood. It's all right. You know, not everybody has a great day. Um, and when you know maybe the great day is not coming your way, take a Vitamin Energy It'll get you in the right mood. The Mood Plus energizes you for seven hours, nourishes the body. Also, a fat burner tastes great. 260 milligrams of all-natural caffeine, lemon balm extract, chamomile flower extract, passion flower extract, rhodelia rosea root extract, valerian root extract. How could you not feel good with all that? And it's all packed in one little bottle. That's not even two ounces. You can take it anywhere with you. Maybe put it in the fridge. I've heard some people put the entire thing in a big bottle of water and just kind of sip on it throughout the day. Um, almost like a beer. And then some people take it like a shot, like a shot. Try and you like it, I think. Go to vitaminenergy.com. Use that promo code WARCHAMPBOGO, WARCHAMP, B-O-G-O. Buy one item, get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free, courtesy of the awesome folks at Vitamin Energy. They're Florida State fans, Florida State alums, all ACC performing alums, mind you. So they know what they're doing when they're making stuff to help enhance performance. Vitamin Energy, shake it and take it. Coming back from things, Corey, were you able to uh, dig deep into these box scores, flesh out some stats for us, maybe some anecdotal evidence? Amari Rogers okay, was, yeah, it was, good. was good the point. guy I've heard of, but there was a guy named Cornell Powell, which I didn't follow Clemson that. I don't remember Clemson all that well back then because, you know, Florida State couldn't stay on the field with him. But he had 11 for 105 against Boston College uh, the first game, the first start. And then the next game against Notre Dame – the guy's name is Cornell Powell. Does that ring a bell at all? Not at all. Right? He had 11 for 105 against Boston College. And then in that game against Notre Dame, he had 6 for 161. Mercy. I, Cornell Powell must be. And it says that he played with the Chiefs in 23, yeah. but I think he was on the practice squad or he might have been cut. But Cornell Powell's got to be like, can DJ get in the league already? <laughs> like, DJ and Run him. I mean, what a, well, that's my dog. They say, yeah, yeah we, we torch everyone. So, yeah, and he also – Trav uh, uh, ETN was yeah. on the team too, Helps. so he had, he had some talent around him. Powell's a four star, number thirty six overall prospect in the country. Well, I don't know what happened to him. Yeah, I don't know oh, that. so he was a senior that year. Yeah, uh, clearly in twenty twenty. Well, he he broke out there with uh with DJ uh, throwing the rock. But so yeah, I think uh, when it when it pertains to DJ again, he's not. This ain't Josh Allen, and he's not Jordan Travis, but that arm will play. Oh, that yeah. arm, that yeah. arm will uh, yeah. that arm is going to make some spectacular plays, and there are going to be some plays or some moments where you're like, "Ugh, why didn't he see that? Why didn't he make the throw that Jordan would have made?" He's not Jordan, but he also can do a, a one thing, but much better than Jordan could, and that's the deep ball, like the deep, deep ball. Hmm. Um, but you know, he's not going to be as good a quarterback um, as Jordan Travis was, and this offense may or not may or may not be as good as last year's. I think it can be especially the end of last year. Um, but, yeah, I, I think what Asla and the angst that he might sound like he has is just it's not clicking yet. But it's not a 
a horror show either. They are making enough plays, and you see the glimpses and the flashes of talent, right, Aslan? Like, Absolutely. it's not like, yes. oh, they need Andrew Parchment to make a play here. They, we are not back in those days at all. They, 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 these receivers can really, really make plays, and there is a chance that this passing game can be really fun to watch and very, very productive. It's just six practices and one scrimmage in, as you probably would have expected, it hasn't clicked against a, uh, a a defense with some really good players. Yeah, fair. I also wonder once this offensive line becomes whole, because sure. yep. it's it's not it's not whole health wise, and it's not whole. I don't think in terms of establishing roles. And again, I get it. This is the the part of the season where you figure this stuff out. But like on Thursday, there were just a lot of situations where it was very fire drill esque, like in some of these. But again, you know, it's Patrick Payton. It's it's Marvin Jones Jr. that's creating this havoc. Uh, you know, it's not a third string guy out there. This isn't a scout look that's beating your first team or so. It's good on good. It's it's really, to be honest, it's probably good on decent right now when we're talking about the offensive line as they as they try to figure all that stuff out. So there's just some of those plays that you see and you're like, man, I, I just don't remember seeing a lot of that. And when it would happen, like Jordan scrambles were there was just something about them where you're like, yeah, that in a game is going to be an absolute backbreaker for that defense. Yeah, Whereas, but he never did it. Yeah. yeah. But last year, you know, I would always say that as we were getting closer and closer to the end and I was foreseeing a playoff run, berth, um, I'm like, wait until he unleashes himself because it's there, I promise, because I was watching it. He would do it, I don't know, man, once a week in practice. Yeah. He would just take off on a scramble, and it'd be one of those where they're blowing the whistle, but there's a DB or verse or whoever who's trying to chase him. And, man, just watching Jordan Travis run flat out, is like it was just always a reminder, like, oh, yeah, that's still there. That's in there, and it hadn't even been used yet. And then it never got to be used. Thanks well, a lot, it, North Alabama. It kind of, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, maybe that North Alabama game was going to be the, the, you know, the the jump off. But, yeah. Well. Uh, Jaden Jones had a TFL as well. In that and last hey, period. we should mention, mention him. Uh, he stood out a few times this this spring so far. And Norvell mentioned him. Maybe he was asked about him. I don't know if it was unsolicited. Or not, I think he was he asked. I think I, I, think yeah. I remember him being asked. But I don't think that's a, I don't think that's absolutely coach speak. I think he's Jaden Jones. If you don't remember, is the he was a JUCO transfer last year that was coming off an injury, uh, barely played, um, and this year he is playing obviously more. He's getting more reps, and he you know he looks the part now. Like I yeah. think he he's he's made a few plays here and there that you're like okay, maybe he's a depth piece this year. He's not going to start, but maybe he could take a leap and be a fifth guy or a fourth guy. I don't know. There was a question we didn't get to on the mailbag the other day. We'll get to it here in a minute. Um, Did want to mention the um, legal unfolding that continues to go on with the Florida State's lawsuit against the ACC. There's nothing we like talking about more, is there, (laughs) Aslan? We we break this down better than anyone. (laughs) Uh, So Florida State had requested – the judge in North Carolina to go ahead and dismiss the, the, uh, the suit from the ACC and uh, you know, for floor state, maybe not doing their fiduciary duties properly. And uh, the judge, I think wrote like a 70 page denial, which doesn't feel great. Uh, but Florida state's response to the ruling said, although it's highly unlikely or rather highly unusual for a court to dismiss a lawsuit at this initial stage, we are disappointed in the court's decision not to dismiss the North Carolina lawsuit. At the same time, we appreciate the ruling that Florida State could not have breached any supposed fiduciary duties to the ACC by seeking legal relief from the conference's gross mishandling of member school media rights. Uh, they say they'll continue to aggressively advocate for the school, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, this is, you know, this is that was like a Hail Mary. Like, oh, we're going to be like, oh, dismiss this. This is without any merit but there's obviously merit too because florida state signed a contract so uh part Just of the, like, part of the process it, everybody isn't the, the acc doing the exact same thing in florida yeah trying yeah. to dismiss florida state's lawsuit yeah. and yeah. um you know i would think hope i'm sure florida state is thinking and hoping and expecting that that uh dismissal will be denied as well mm. so this is just the the legal wranglings that are that are happening um with uh, with two two uh, entities suing each other, I just I know it's all going to end at some point. Clearly, obviously, I just want to get to that point 
so fast. Not even so much for Florida State's betterment. I just can't keep up with all this stuff. Like on a day where this lawsuit, you know, the the request to dismiss gets denied, you've got the athletic writing like a huge story about private equity and and the NFL's second lieutenant behind Roger Goodell aligning himself with some college chancellors and presidents to form a super league Corey. I think they said Mm -hmm. 60 or 70 teams that will constantly stay at this upper level of football. And then there'll be 10 teams that get relegated or get promoted to then be able to play in this super league, 10 teams, eight divisions, Eight yeah. division champions get a playoff spot, eight wild cards. It all sounds great. And then six paragraphs into it, it pretty much says none of the conference commissioners sat down to speak with this group that's trying to create the Super League. Uh, mentions the fact that all these conferences are due for huge windfalls when they sign their new TV contracts. The seven or eight billion dollar college football playoff contract that is now signed. Because the Super League thing, apparently, like they they want to do away with conferences. They want to do away with the college football playoff. They want to be the, the one centralized body to govern the rules for college football and then negotiate together as a whole to get more revenue from TV contracts, which sounds okay, which sounds kind of plausible and, and practical in, in, in practice and in, in theory. But again, the Big Ten has separated their TV contracts separately from everybody else, and so has the SEC, and they're getting a whole bunch of money. And I don't know where the incentive is for those guys to say, all right, no, let's let's all leverage our buying power together. And it, it sounds really cool, the Super League, but then again, like you, you drill down into it, and there's there's no reason to think Greg Sankey's going to let his conference dissolve or Tony Petiti's going to let his conference dissolve, and then everybody get together and try to, you know, uh, again, leverage these rights. Because the whole thing underpinning this, Corey, seems to be that College presidents don't like the way they've been getting pushed around mm. by their television partners, so they kind of want to take the fight to them. But it's like, since when have college presidents really want to get involved over the top with the way athletics are governed and administered and want to take risks? Just seems out of their wheelhouse. But so it'd be a, it'd be a league of sixty teams. No man, eighty. 70, it's like 70, 60 to 70 of the teams I think would, would always stay in this upper league. I I guess 70. And then the other 10 that would come rotating. Yeah. Would, would, you know, coastal Carolina, Liberty, you know, some years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Miami's not one of the 70, right? They're not grandfathered into this at all. I don't want them any nowhere near this thing. Oh, now, now Corey wants to throw. Right. Right. Guys. Who's with me? Who's with me? Keep the gains out. Uh, look, man, I, I, Yes, clearly the SEC would not want this. Why would they vote for it? And the SEC run, SEC and Big Ten run the sport. So why would they even entertain something like this? But if you offer them a billion more, yeah. maybe they would. You know, that's that's the only way it would happen. You, money talks, and clearly, I mean, Lord knows money talks uh, in this sport and in, in life in general. Um, so that's the only way something like this would happen is you would tr- you would outbid – what they're going to get from these these other these TV network deals, which just doesn't seem feasible, anytime soon. But you know, th- you know, maybe Elon wants to have his own college football. League. Yeah, or Tim Cook. Because again, yeah, like who are you going to negotiate with? Like NBC and you know ESPN. They're the they're the ones that are behind everything with the SEC and the Big Ten. But it, the only thing that I did that makes me slightly curious about all this is that the NFL's like second in command almost, or like, you know, the right hand man for Roger Goodell is like involved in this super league kind of behind the scenes or whatever. So you would think that maybe the NFL is like, all right, we want to be involved in, in shaping the way the college football is going to look like, because you guys help provide us the talent, you know, year after year. And nobody dictates anything to the NFL, right? Like the NFL absolutely dictates everything to their television partners, their television partners, would give up everything to get more inventory of the NFL. Like I don't there, there's part of the ESPN thing where I still think ESPN, even over the sec still wields control over them where like yeah. Jimmy Pitaro is still more powerful ultimately than Greg Sankey. 
Which is crazy. It's the tail wagging the dog. Like, it's Sankey's product that ESPN yes. should be begging for, not Sankey begging ESPN. Yes. Um, but that's that's how it works right now. And look, I would – honestly, a, a proposal like this is where I've always seen it going at some point in our lives where there are – there is just one super college football league, which is like the NFL light. It's the minor leagues. It wouldn't be great. It, it certainly would be a complete – well, it already is completely different than how we grew up. Um, but – and then the conferences can still exist with every single other sport. And college football is just its own entity because college football is its own entity. It 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 is not it's it's unlike any other sport in in intercollegiate athletics. It's not close. It is apples and canoes that you can't compare it to any other sport. So it would be awesome if it broke away. And then Stanford and Cal wouldn't be in the ACC. The Pac-12 could still be the Pac-12 and just kill it in rowing and volleyball and not have to come across the country to row. I guess the Stanford – who are they going to row against? What, is, there a, is there a natural rowing rival for Stanford in the ACC? I assume Boston College has rowing, right? Don't they love that stuff in Dude, That's a legitimately good question, and there cannot be. I mean, I wonder what happened. There's no way they're going to let those sports die on the vine. I, I'll have to dig into that at some point on the on the in the weekend. Uh, next uh, next show, let's look up like the best ACC rowing teams. I assume Virginia or Duke. They're all hotty toddy. They probably have a rowing team. I would think. Hoity toity, um, hotty toddy. Hoity toity. What's hotty toddy? It's Ole Miss. Yeah. I can promise you, Ole Miss doesn't have a rowing team. <laughs> They don't. They're not rowing. Uh, so I, I would. I would love for this to be what happens. That college football is just broken away, because it has nothing to do with intercollegiate athletics. Um, but you know that's not going to happen because it's too much money right now. But if there was a way to keep them still affiliated with universities, they're still students, but they get paid, uh, like real payment, not nil craziness, but real payment. And uh, it's its own entity. It's its own league run by a, a commissioner. Who would you would hope would actually have the league in the best interest of the college football teams at heart? Uh, then you know maybe there's a way that college football doesn't implode upon itself. But right now, I mean, that's a better proposal than where we're heading, right? Which is just two leagues of yeah. thirty teams. Yeah, and you we're know? not in it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah ain't in it. So. Wouldn't that be great? Florida State sues, finally gets out of the ACC, and they're like, guys, Super League. Right. Every all eighty teams are invited. Let's go play. And you're like, wait, what? what? So we just paid the ACC 150 million for nothing. Yeah. So that would be Florida State's luck. So uh, hopefully it happens either before that or well, well after it. Yeah, the Syracuse Chancellor is quoted extensively in the athletic piece and goes on to say that you know it's his belief that the the con the the conferences are going to go broke here in a few years once all these lawsuits because apparently there's lawsuits out there for back pay. NIL like players basically suing you didn't their NIL wasn't around when we played we should have been able to make money and apparently a lot of these schools feel like they're going to probably lose that lawsuit and the schools and the conferences are going to get sued in these lawsuits and have to pay a bunch of money and then that's going to probably drive some of these conferences to extinction at least that's this Syracuse Chancellor's theory okay so. all right well um, apparently, lots of schools row. Uh, Duke, Notre Dame, Clemson, North Carolina, Louisville. Clemson does have the lake. Boston College. Well, who's good? Do we know who's good? Uh, that I don't know. Let me see. Uh, national. Oh, there's there's the, the, the Pocock CRCA poll. Let's go to the April 3rd one. Stanford's number one in the country. Princeton's Weird. two. Um, Syracuse is eighth. Let's Virginia's go, 11th, Duke's okay. 13th. All right, sorry. I didn't realize we had a, such a robust uh, – there's a Harvard Radcliffe. Okay. So I guess there's two – I'll Harvard. be honest with you, though. I know Stanford's number one and Syracuse is eighth. I think this might be the year for the for the Qs. Okay. I think okay. they might have some uh, – are we doing men's or women's right now? Was women's. It, women's. Women. Yeah, yeah. I think it might be the year for Syracuse. Yeah, all right. We'll see how it goes. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be a great last thing for Florida State to enjoy as a member of the ACC? Yeah. It's the Syracuse women's rowing team <laughs> knocking off Stanford. Uh, a shout-out to our guy, Mignats. He asked a question on the uh, mailbag show that we dropped on Thursday. Actually bumped into him at practice with his son on Thursday, Corey. He got his kid out of school for the day. Field trip. Oh, cool. Let's go watch nice. practice. I like so. that. I like that. That's good father-son stuff, for real. Yeah, yeah. so that was cool. Shout-out to him. Uh, the question we didn't get to was from Nullboy02. 
your favorite Ernie Sims moment memory during his FSU career. For me, and if we ever get Ernie on the pod, I'm, I'm definitely going to ask him about it, was his freshman year, 2003, in Gainesville. Mm. The first, I don't know if it was the entire game, or at least like the first half, every single time the Gators kick the ball off, Ernie was like was like a was a front line guy on the kick return unit, yeah. and he would just bolt at the Gator kicker and just try to destroy him. And I think he did a few times. Yeah, like he didn't backtrack and backpedal and try to set up for the kick return. They would kick the ball off. Ernie would run forward and and just slam into the kicker every single time. So I don't know if that was him freelancing or like Mickey talking about it going into that week. That's what we're gonna do. But that's my favorite Ernie Sims moment memory. I don't have a single memory. Uh, I just remember being um, – that was such a rare combination. And I'm talking – I mean, I've been watching Florida State my whole life, and they've had some, literally some of the best football players that have ever walked the earth have come through Florida State. Man, it is – you were hard-pressed to find a combination of speed and power uh, like that guy. Uh, just unbelievable. I don't know what he ended up being listed at. Was he 6'2", 240? Uh, but he could really move – he was a freight train. He was so fast and so violent uh, and so strong. And it was so early. Like, it was uh, – it, it happened so early in his – like, he didn't play a lot as a true freshman because there were good guys in front of him. But uh, our veterans – well, good guys, but they were veterans. But, man, you just – even when he got in late in games, you're like, that's just different. Hmm. That And I, I think he had c- concussion issues in the league. Because uh, he was he was drafted high, he was a first round he was pick. A first round pick, yeah. and I and I think he he started off his career really well, and I just think unfortunately he had concussion issues. Um, but I mean, but I mean that's kind of the way he played too. He was just he was uh, just a wrecking ball of a of a linebacker. Just ninth, either, ninth overall, Corey. Yeah, man. I mean, he was he, because of I mean, think about that size, that body, and then that speed. Mm-hmm. What a combination, man. Just uh, one of the rare, rare athletes. Him and Cromartie at the same time. And you feel like because of the, the time of the, the – where the program was at the time, you didn't get to experience just how unbelievably uh, unique those two guys were. Yeah. I know Cromartie missed his last year. but And they had big moments, and they started, and they, they, won, some, they won games. But, you know, if those two guys had played in the 90s, uh, the, you know, they would be – thought of as all timers I think yeah. it's just they were unfortunately um they came right there in the in the middle of the lost decade yeah. two local kids though yeah their recruitment local is products what, yeah their recruitment is really what uh, that's what made me sign up for a membership at war Chan. I, I first heard about war Chan in oh two, yeah right in 2002 when the whole Adrian McPherson stuff was happening that's how I found out about war Chan. but then as I was checking it out, that was going into the 2003 calendar year, and it was the 2003 recruiting class. And there's there's this photo I'll always remember. It's like Ernie's Ernie's wearing, I think, like a beanie. He's got like tinted glasses on, not sunglasses, but I think like tinted eyeglasses. And he's wearing just a red vest, and he's on the sideline out of game with his arms crossed, mm. and he just looks like Adonis. And I'm like, yeah. we're not losing him. Please tell me we're not losing him. And so he was he wasn't wearing a shirt, just a vest. Correct, just a vest. Oh, man, you should you should replicate that at the next practice we're at. Oh, well, yeah, I'll see if maybe he remembers it. <laughs> yeah. Like remember that? So um hey, mybookie.ag. It's a Final Four women's Final Four as well, too, right? Or is yeah, it Elite yeah, eight? tonight? Tonight's oh, yeah. the Final Four for women. There we go. Head to mybookie.ag, use the promo code WARCHANT when you sign up for the first time, and you'll get an instant cash deposit bonus. Yukon I love how the UConn is getting on the bottom line for their flight having problems arriving or something like yeah, that. They did it three days before the game. I know. It's like, come on. Relax, everybody. Relax, everybody. Uh, we see. A, I see a first half line right now in each game. Purdue favored by five in the first half. UConn favored by six and a half in the first half. Um, man, I still – I almost want to pick North Carolina State to win the whole darn thing. The Do game it, at man. least. The Do game it. at least. Yeah. I'll get I'll get crazy. You folks don't. You bet responsibly. Again, that promo code is WarChant Instant Cash Deposit Bonus. Promo requires fifty dollars minimum deposit and rollover requirement of one time your deposit total, including bonus for withdrawal. For full terms and conditions, visit mybookieag slash about dash us. Nothing to deal with Florida State, Corey. Sorry. Thoughts on Andy Enfield officially taking that SMU job and now Eric Musselman going to USC. That would have been like a nice coup. I just. Those are the kind of coaches you would love to get, probably if you're Florida State, right? Like a like a proven head coach that mm. wasn't kicked out of his former school, but that's probably not what will happen 
when Leonard's done with his career here at Florida State, which we assume is going to last through this upcoming season. Yeah, I think infield was it, that was tenuous there, right? Like they that was yeah two lottery picks and LeBron James's kid on his team, and they had a losing record. Uh, so it had it had gotten you know the seat was at least getting turned up uh, out there, and he'd been there for a decade, right? Like that Dunk City yeah. Florida Gulf Coast team yeah. was like 11 or 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he'd been out there. It was a good run out there in L.A. I mean, they got them to the tournament a few times. I think they made the Sweet 16 a couple times. So, good run for him. Uh, yeah, I just don't – I don't think you're going to get a uh, somebody in their 50s. Mm. I don't – maybe Cassell. I guess Cassell might be in his – yeah, he is. Might be in his 50s if that's the guy they go at. I don't think Florida State is going to get um, a longtime veteran college head coach. I think it's going to be an up-and-comer. Or it's going to be an assistant from somewhere else. Unless Rick Patino wants to come back to the ACC. Or Calipari. Yeah. If Calipari wants a, a change of scenery. I, I, you know, he doesn't feel appreciated in Kentucky. Come on. All right. We're done here, everybody. Uh, Jeff Cameron Show is going to fill in the gaps 1 to 3 o'clock. Jeff actually offered up some observations in the Renegade Room, y'all. Mm, the Renegade nice. Room. That's uh, like premium, premium access over on the on 3 uh, warchant.com message boards. Ad-free experience. So uh, you can check those out. You can listen to them at 1 to 3 o'clock. Florida State taking on Boston College. Email came over uh, the other night. Looks like they're um, moving the game up to 1 o'clock today, and then they're going to play Nooners on yeah. Saturday and Sunday. I think it's going to be like a high of 40-something. Man, good grief. Good luck, guys. Um, just so we yeah, win the series. I was going to. I was talking to somebody at practice. I'm like, are they going to get a sweep? And it's like, nah. I'm just like, win the series. Yeah. yeah, just win the series. That's what you need to do. Two just out of three. And I'm sure softball's got an ACC conference. Louisville at Thank Louisville. Yep. My man, my man, Corey Clark doing it. All right, uh, that's it. We're done. Go to wordchant.com, the ultimate Semmel sports horse. Scrimmage Saturday, Zoom will be on it. And that I think that'll – let's let's get some good stuff out of Mike, hopefully. Hopefully Mike's in a good mood. That'll make me in a better mood. We'll do a podcast for you all folks on Monday. That's how we do it. He's Corey Maslow. Thanks for listening to Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.